I just got in a fresh pack of double A batteries. Oh, there's a big guy. Oh, for you. Yeah, he made something up about that. He said he plays basketball or something. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so. Uh, so we were making our way into the beginnings of the uh, Carbonyl chapter then. Oh, before that, right? I gotta tell you, right here, guys, I'm proud of you. I right? think almost everyone got to make some acetyl uh, ferrocene now. We finally got it all knocked out. Almost everybody. <laughs> no, no, no. I think we got it all kind of figured out and nuanced, although it's still a, uh, it's kind of a question mark as to why some of the stuff didn't work in the way that it, uh, in the way that it didn't work, right? It failed in unexpected manners, right? Which is uh, always something interesting in the realm of science, right? So why, why is that? But anyway, so uh, when we come back, then we'll we'll wrap up the ferrocene uh, lab there. I know some of you guys still have a column to run, and some of the NMRs and IRs and that kind of thing. And then we'll learn how to distill something, right? And uh, there'll be another uh, another lab that goes with that. And uh, we, we don't have too much longer left in the, in the semester, do we? Then, right? Because we got what three weeks in March and basically three weeks in uh, April, right? Because we got the Easter is kind of a half week. So we got essentially we got about six weeks left, right? We got an exam that's going to be coming up, right? I think. Well, yeah. The second week. The second week. Yeah. It's not like the week after, it's not the week right after spring break. I think it's the week after that, right? So, hey, look, 20 minutes a day. That's all I'm telling you guys to do, right? You got to keep up with it. It has to be, it has to be done. Um, but yeah, so uh, we, all that to say we end, we end the first half of the semester here, so to speak, on a good note, right? Everyone made red and yellows. Got the exam coming up, and, and we've learned quite a bit already this semester, right? But that's also part of the challenge of OCHEM too, which is that there's a lot of reactions that come in with this stuff, right? Just think about how many different reactions we've learned how to add things in the aromatic chapter itself, right? Now we're going to bring in all the stuff that we're learning here in the carbonyls, so it's even more, right? And that's and that's good, and that's bad. It's good because it gives you guys lots of options to make things, but it's uh, well, I, I hesitate to use the word bad, but it's challenging in the sense that we have to remember what functional groups can we use with what and when and how and why and, you know, when is an acid too much of an acid, right? You know, okay, is it going to react with this? All right, so there's a lot of kind of, you know, bits and pieces that come together with this. Right? So make sure that you guys are spending a little bit of time, even over break. I know, you got, no, Dr. H, I need seven uninterrupted days of staring at a wall. <laughs> Don't understand that, right? Spend, make sure you guys spend a little bit of time just kind of looking through some things, thinking about things, right? That kind of stuff over there too, right? Because it's uh, when we get back, right? We're gonna keep going, right? So uh, enjoy your break, but also make sure that you guys aren't uh, actively, you know, trying to forget things. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So anyway, uh, we had launched, or we had, had, had gotten into carbonyls. Uh, was it last time or the time before? Um, oh, yeah, okay, yeah. so last time we had talked a little bit more about um, <coughs> our acetyl groups, and we had talked about how they're protecting, right? So if we put a couple equivalents of alcohols in with some, a catalytic amount of acid in with a carbonyl, uh, specifically aldehydes or ketones, okay, specifically aldehydes or ketones, then we're going to end up making an acetal, right? And that's useful because acetals aren't going to be reactive under basic conditions. Did I start recording? I think. Yeah, you did. Okay, cool. All right, good. So I captured all my mistakes on, on video too. Fantastic. <laughs> right, right. So we, uh, we, we they, once we make an acetal, they're not going to be reactive under basic conditions. All right. So that's going to be important. But then the other end of a protecting group is we have to be able to revert it back to the carbonyl. Right, and so if we put an acetal under aqueous acidic conditions, it's going to do the exact reverse mechanism, right? The exact reverse reaction to get back to where we started out, and we end up back with our carbonyl group there, right? Extremely important. Now, there's a couple nuances that we just wanted to talk about, 
Um, we talked about uh, ethylene glycol here, how we make that cyclical diether there, and we talked about some of the important aspects of this, right? We talked about inter, excuse me, intramolecular reactions, right? Intramolecular uh, hydrogen uh, or proton, uh, what's the word I'm looking for here? When proton go place, right? <laughs> this, right? right? So the, the hydrogen getting transferred intramolecular, right? So that's, gonna, that's probably going to be the faster reaction to happen. Why does this second equivalent of alcohol loop back in? Well, remember we talked about collision theory again, and you don't think you have to be at the right, taint, uh, right time, at the right place, right, with the right speed, with blah, 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 blah. All this stuff has to come together for those alcohols to actually attack that carbonyl. Right? But the, if this is already tethered to the same molecule, then it's pretty easy for it to just kind of loop around and uh, form that cyclical uh, diether there. Right? So that's usually the preferred alcohol that we put in there. Although there's another, uh, there's another protecting group which I'll show you guys in just a little bit, okay? But, um, so yeah, we said that we can uh, uh, protect aldehydes and ketones. So let's think about this just a little bit, then, right? Something very useful to note. Okay, so we got this. Uh, this is going to make, oh, yeah, sorry, well, I should specify. So if we have, let's try this once more, right? If we have one equivalent, right, just one equivalent of our alcohol in there, right, our diol in there, okay? So think about what that means to be one equivalent, right? We've got two carbonyl groups. If I wanted to protect both of them, right, I would have to put at least two equivalents into this, right? So I'm controlling my stoichiometry. I'm only putting one equivalent of my diol in there. And interestingly enough, when I do that, this is the product that we get. Sound good? Okay, let's move on to the next idea. <laughs> so, here's my question. What do you think it's going to be? Why? Why? <laughs> what is this telling us? Right? Why does this happen? So first of all, if I have one equivalent, the same reaction happens, right? I make my acetal. What's reacting though? The aldehyde. The aldehyde. Why? Hmm? Sterics. It could be. Sterics could have a role in this. Okay, well, if it probably isn't sterics, then it's got to be electronics. electronics. Okay, so why? What's different electronically about an aldehyde versus a ketone? Is it because the carbon bonds carbon, carbon, or carbon hydrogen bonds, right? I just didn't draw it in there in the product, but that hydrogen is still on it, right? Yeah. I just put it in there to emphasize that's an aldehyde, right? Hmm. Let's see. What's a major concept we talked about last, or at the beginning of this chapter? It's the first set of reactions I asked you guys, yeah. Well, wouldn't, like, would it have to do with how positive Probably, right? Because remember, what's the first set of reactions I asked you guys? I said, what happens to a ketone under basic conditions? What happens under acidic conditions, right? And that's going to depend, right? Because our alcohol is a weak nucleophile. So we have to protonate that oxygen to be able for it to come in and attack the carbonyl carbon, to make it more likely for that to happen, right? Because why? What does protonating the oxygen do effectively? Uh, <laughs> That's okay. Take a, take a minute and think about it, right? You don't have to have an immediate answer. Right? Something to do with 
conspiracy maybe. I never had a plan. <laughs> you, you guys are right, right? It's, it's something to do with the positive charge in that carbon, but what, in essence, does protein and carbon dioxide do? Well, hang on to that thought for a second. It makes, we can start to form better resonant structures, which puts more of a positive charge on that carbonyl carbon. Okay? Now think about this for a second, right? If I am a weak nucleophile, uh, well, let me back up for just a second. I'm a nucleophile. What am I on the hunt for? Something positive. If I can have a bigger positive charge, I'm more likely to go after it. You guys with me on this? Now, if I'm a weak nucleophile, how can I motivate it to do something? Give it as big a positive charge as it can for it to go after, right? Even a weak nucleophile is partially negative, right? The alcohol, the oxygen is partially negative, right? So if I can make the carbonyl, uh, carbon more positive, then it's going to be more likely to attack that. And then, right, oh, oh let, me, let me pause for a second. So does, does everyone make sense with that? This is, this is you know... Jet, uh, organic chemistry 101, right? Negatives attacks positives. Make something more positive, negatives more likely to attack it, right? So why would an aldehyde be more positive than a ketone then? Inductive effects, got it. Now what's going on with it? Okay, so remember what inductive effects are, okay? So remember that oxygen on the carbonyl groups, right? It's electronegative, it's withdrawing electron density from that carbon. Therefore, that carbon feels partially positive. Now, because that carbon feels partially positive, what's going on? Well, it's starting to draw electrons from the bonds around it, right? That's what inductive effects are, through uh, bond, you know, through bond interactions, right? Through bond electron tug of war, right? That sounds scientific, <laughs> right? We're drawing electron density to ourselves physically through the bonds that are attached to us, right? We make the electrons hang around us more. Got it? So the difference then is a ketone to an aldehyde, right? The ketone's gonna have more electrons around it. And so it's gonna be able to draw more electrons to it, which makes it feel less positive than the aldehyde does. Got it? So question, who cares, right? Who cares, so what? That's one of the key parts of organic two that I keep mentioning to you guys. Selectivity. I can selectively protect my aldehyde groups. Got it? This is important. What does this mean? It means selectively I'm going to protect my aldehyde groups, which means I can do chemistry at the carbonyl, excuse me, at the at the ketone, right? Do what I need to do there, and then come back and deprotect and get my aldehyde back. Got it? If I don't do that, then we're about, we're going to probably have a 50-50 mix of the aldehyde and the ketone reacting. In fact, the aldehyde will probably react a little bit more than the ketone because of the reasons that we just explained, right? Everybody with me on this? This is a very, very, very useful and simple idea, right? We can just control stoichiometry, control equivalence if you want to, right? Good? All right, so real quick, one last bit of this that I wanted to talk about is just what is uh, H plus, right? So the book uses two things, H2SO4. Uh, that's okay-ish. Um, and then it also talks about P-toluene, wow, I'll get this right, sulfonic acid, okay. P-T-S-H is how this is sometimes abbreviated. Okay. P-toluene, so para-toluene sulfonic acid, right? Um, the P-T-S-H there is a nice white powder. It's uh, cheap, easy to make, right? You just put a little couple of granules, a couple of crystals into your reaction. And it acts as a catalytic acid, right? You just put a couple of granules in there, you don't have to worry about it. Sulfuric acid, you could use it. I mean, really, what's the difference between those two up there, right? One's just a derivative of sulfuric acid, right? The p-toluene, uh, sulfonic acid is just a derivative, right? 
So question, why would we even bother then? So here's another difference that we don't really talk about too much in this class. Right? P-toluene sulfonic acid is an organic soluble acid. Right? I can put it into things like dichloromethane. Right? I can put it into you know, uh, THF. Some of these, uh, I think it, I don't know, it might even be soluble in hexane, right? some of these things. Right? It's soluble in more right, organic solvents. Like sulfuric acid, you know, it's not overly soluble in things like hexane. Right? So you have to be careful that there is a decision to make about what solvent you're using for a reaction. Okay? Now again, we're doing chemistry on paper, so we can hand wave some of this stuff, right? But just so you're aware, right, we have a couple different options for that. The, key, uh, the other key part of this reaction is making sure we remove water while we're doing this, okay? And that's why you'll usually see it in the book with a minus H2O, whatever they set up this reaction, okay? They're drawing water out in some way. Good? Uh, no. Mm -hmm. What about like the methane like Yeah, so remember, that's actually going to uh, make the sulfur more negative, right? Because that sulfur has a positive charge, it's going to be drawing an electron density from, from the ring, right? Which is actually going to make it a weaker acid, right? Whereas on the other hand, there we've got these, we've got another oxygen in that group that's probably going to be withdrawing more electrons to make the OH bond a little bit weaker. For all intents and purposes, we can just consider them about equal in strength, though, right? We're not going to be making any K arguments here, so to speak, right? Uh, okay, so now, quick question. Uh, how many classes have we spent now talking about this heal, you know, uh, forming acetals and all that stuff? These two. Uh, yeah, about two, two and a half ish almost. All right, is that because I really like saying the word acetyl? Right? Yes, of course it is. Right? <laughs> right? You guys get the point that I'm saying, right? I think we've kind of nitpicked every single detail that we that we really can in this reaction, right? Probably means it's important. We might see it every once in a while, right? We might have to use it if we're doing synthesis and be able to explain it. But the, re the other reason why is because this is one of these key reactions that t teach us key concepts about how different carbonyl groups react. Why do we need to put acid in? What happens when we put base? You know, what's the difference in reactivity of a ketone versus an aldehyde? These kind of things. Extremely important, right? So thinking about the concepts, it's not just that I want to spend, you know, two, two or three days on this stuff. It's like, hey, we're going to be calling back to these same ideas over and over and over as we talk more about these carbonyls. Right, so paying attention to the idea of inductive effects and hysterics and you know how many equivalents we have and which group is more reactive and all this kind of stuff. Right, it's going to be important. Okay? Why do we have to remove water as we do this reaction, this kind of stuff? Okay? All right. So let's talk about a we'll take kind of a we'll dip our toes into a different chapter here a bit, although it is technically in chapter 19.
this is the easy part, right? What is HCM? That's an acid, right? Hydrogen cyanide. Okay, we're under acidic conditions, and what's going to happen first? Right, don't need the carbonyl oxygen, which makes the carbonyl carbon more susceptible to attack. What do we have around that could attack it then? The new, what specific nucleophile? The, cy the cyanide, right? The CN minus the conjugate base of the HCN, right? So nothing too mysterious here. Everything kind of is as expected. with this. Okay? Great. Fantastic. All right, this is a uh, uh, cyanohydrin is what this is called. Right? Cyanohydrin. Okay. And there's some nuances in the book about, uh, you know, why can we not just use HCN and why do we, why should we put some KCN in there and these kind of things? And that's fine. You can you can you can read through that um, if you want to and kind of it's 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 true. Technically we should do the reaction like this where we have a mixture of the acid and the base in there, right? The conjugate base. And that just helps the reaction go a little bit faster is all it is, right? Just helps make it kind of stick so to speak. Okay? So we have a cyanohydrate. Now, who cares, right? Well, this is actually interesting, right? So if we take these cyanohydrins, we can actually do uh, some interesting chemistry with them. Okay. So let's do this first. It's all said and done. That is our product. Okay. So, see if you guys can rationalize or start to think of a mechanism wherein we can take a cyano group into an amine using our good old buddy LAH. I keep what you use in that LH. Now remember, LH is a beast, right? And it's going to go after everything. Very, very, very reactive. assume that there's an excess of LH
Right? So what you're saying is, hmm, got some charges around here that I need to stabilize in some way. Right? So what's the only, so that's not around, what's the only positive thing that's around? The aluminum, right? So what's going to be attached to that? does this work? Okay. What is oxygen? Uh, <laughs> an electronegative element, right? So it's an electronegative atom that is bound with a pi bond to a carbon. You guys see what I'm saying? Right? That's what a carbonyl is. Good. What's a nitrogen? It's an electronegative atom that's bound with pi bonds to a carbon. So practically speaking, how's the mechanism going to be different? Different. It's not, except it's going to happen what? Twice, because how many pi bonds are there? Got it? So is the mechanism going to be any different? No. What's going to happen? Hydride comes in, hits that carbon, right? The nitrile carbon pops up a pi bond, right? Then another hydride comes in, hits that carbon, and pops up a pi bond. Good? That's all it is. Life is easy sometimes. Why are you guys making it hard? Well, Dr. H, it's because this is working in chemistry. And it's designed to trick and to frustrate and to make everybody annoyed. Right. <laughs> right? But you guys get this is important. We're going to talk, cyanos have these kind of habit of just like popping up every once in a while, right? In different, uh, in different situations. We're going to talk about them quite a bit in the amine chapter, okay? But guess how they're going to behave? Well, there's an electronegative atom that's bound with pi bonds to a carbon. So they're going to behave very similarly to a carbonyl group. Got it? Are there going to be differences? Sure. All right? There's two pi bonds, nitrogen, you know, subtly less electronegative, these kind of things. All right? But in general, if you're stuck on a desert island, right, and you're thinking about cyanos, they're going to behave just like carbonyls. Yeah? Um, how does the nitrogen get The water in the second part that we bring in. So do you, do you have like two negative charges on the nitrogen? Aha, so question, right? That's, 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 uh, that's interesting here, right? So here is something that we've kind of hand waved as we go through this, right? So. In, hits that carbon, pops that up, right? So we have this, right? So what happens here is basically, oops, not that, right? That negative is going to start to associate with an aluminum, right? And when you do that, you actually end up making a Neutral, right? That's going to be a neutral molecule there. Right? And this is interesting also. 
Because what's going to happen next? It's the next part of this mechanism. Another hydride comes in and hits that carbon that's bound to the nitrogen, yes? Where's that hydride going to come from? The, probably the, the aluminum, all right, that's bound to that molecule itself there, right? Is it now, is it always going to be like that? No, right? But if we're in this situation, that's a perfectly acceptable mechanistic step to make, right? So it can go in and we can have another hydride from here, kind of hit that, right, and pop that up, and then we're kind of stuck uh, with this right here, right? So we're kind of stuck with that right there until we add the water and then the water chews off the aluminum and reprobates the nitrogen and all this kind of stuff, right? And with a negative charge is extremely basic, extremely basic, very easy for it to grab uh, protons from water. Aluminum loves oxygen. So any oxygen that has around is usually going to react very quickly uh, to make some aluminum oxides. Got it? What's that? Why is the aluminum chewed down to the nitrogen when it's actually going up to the carbon? Mm -hmm. yeah. No, the aluminum's not going up there. The, the hydrogen, hydrogen, right? We're saying we could draw this another way, right? Where we do like this and then that, right? So remember, LAH is essentially H with the lone pair and the negative charge, right? So we're just kind of shorthanding, shorthanding. So would the nitrogen bond to the aluminum again? That's how it's happening. This would probably happen all at once, yeah. Probably happen all at once, but we have to be careful. It's not a cyclic. I doubt it's a cyclical mechanism in there where the two add exactly at the same time. I don't think it works that way. It could. I genuinely don't know, but I doubt it. Right. That's all I'm saying. All right, good, who cares? Well, what do we have here? Well, now we have a way of adding a carbon and a nitrogen to a carbonyl, right? And now we have two functional groups, right? And we can go on and do some interesting things with these, right? We have an alcohol there, which we know a lot to do, and uh, eventually we'll learn how to do some more things with the amines, and so we can go through and um, do some chemistry with the amines there also, all right? Fantastic. Next. Thank you. Sorry. So if we Aqueous acid, fantastic. about this again. What did I just tell you guys when you're thinking about the reactivity of cyanos? Yeah, right? They're basically like carbonyls. The first example we did was a basic condition that we saw an attack at the quote carbonyl carbon, right? Now we're under what? Acidic conditions. Hmm. I wonder what's going to happen, right? How does it change? Like with carbonyls from acidic to basic conditions. Under basic, we start with attack of the carbonyl. Under acidic, we do what? Protonate the electronegative atom first. So what do you think is going to happen here? Or what would be a reasonable assumption, maybe we should say? Now what, what would happen here?
but just like with the carbon, you'll be nitrogen with a tag. You get propane the first time. No, we don't have any cyanide around in this case, right? But like, we use a lot. Oh, we do, don't we? Okay, so do that. So you got the right idea, right? So in year something happens. If something that happens, what do you make at this point? If you think about it, right, you've got the oxygen, you've got a double bond next to it. Then it's going to continue on with what you did there. Okay, looks like we're all on the right, kind of the right path here. So let's let's start to put some ideas together. Um, okay, so just to keep things a little bit simple. Okay. Under acidic conditions, we protonate the electronegative atom, okay? Which does what? The positive charge layer onto the, onto the carbon, right? Which makes the carbon more likely to be attacked by weak nucleophiles, okay? Clean things up for just a minute. Bring in some water to uh, Okay. So I think everybody hopefully can get to this point, right? Without without having to wait for me. But now we gotta think for just a second, okay? So if we take a look at this structure right here, now remember, okay, can we have that? Can we make an enol? No. Why? It'll tautomerize into the carbonyl. Is it because there's a C double bond C, or is it just because there's a double bond attached to the carbon? that's attached to the alcohol. I'm going to give you the answer. If you have a double bond anywhere near an alcohol, it's going to tautomerize. Got it? So what do we have in our intermediate down there? A double bond attached to the carbon that's attached to the alcohol. Got it? So what's going to happen? Tautomerization. Generic classification, yeah, more specifically. One of the most important functional groups for you biochemists. Hmm? 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 Yeah, it's true, but it's bound to the same carbon out of the double bond double bond.
What Google has to say? Amino acids. Uh, well, they get formed when amino amino acids come together to form peptides, right? So in biology, because they do that, they call those peptide bonds, right? And organic, we would call that an amide, right? Amide, that is an amide. A nice stable carbon mill. That is an amide. Now, if we didn't have heat, okay, if we didn't have heat as part of this reaction, we would actually stop at that place there, okay? You could actually stop and isolate that amide. Amides are pretty darn stable, okay? So we'd actually stop at that point. But we got heat and we still have acid. So something else has to happen. The wheels have to keep turning, right? I don't know. So see if you guys can take from the amide there down to the carboxylic acid. And I want you guys to think, okay, are we still under acidic conditions? Do we still have a carbonyl? So what's going to get protonated first? Carbonyl oxygen. Okay, so proceed from there. Remember again, formation of the formation of the cat. Right? Cool. All right. Uh -huh. So we need to make it want to leave. It's a good way of making an electronator out of want to leave. We need electrons. It's positive, right? So we know we have to get rid of that hydrogen. Mm -hmm. Perfect. There you go. You got it. under acidic conditions, don't work with the acid.
struggling water to do this, but you know, that's why. But this is this is this is pretty basic for the active any of the active right here. So good, you got it. If you guys are okay with it, um, we'll just, let's say we'll just zoom in at the MI, right? We'll, we can add the other stuff back in later, right? It's not involved with the mechanism. You guys, you guys got what I mean? Right? So, under acidic conditions, Still nothing unusual, but now we've got an oxygen with a positive charge, and we know we have to make that nitrogen leave, right? Now, again, nitrogen is not all that dissimilar to oxygen. How do we make an OH leave? By giving it a positive charge in some way. So how could we make an NH leave? You're making it positive in some way, got it? So we have to do two things. We have to get rid of the positive charge here by getting rid of this hydrogen, and we have to give this a hydrogen to give it a positive charge. So what's going to happen? All right, probably something like this, right? Now we've got a leaving group attached to a carbon with an alcohol on it, right, which is a good setup to form a carbonyl and kick that off. Okay, and we end up with this, and then some water comes in and cleans it up. Right? shuffle, we would still end up at the carbon acid, right? Good. So hydrolysis of nitriles. I'm sorry, did you guys get did you guys catch on that before the scroll back up? So taking a look at page 936, 937, that's kind of where they introduce some of these ideas, okay? Extremely useful, because all nitriles will behave in this way. Have we seen ways that we can add nitriles to it? Ah. Well, we can add a nitrile to an aromatic ring, right? Using our diazonium salts. Could we hydrolyze that nitrile? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. I'm going to go with yes. <laughs> right? So this is good. Now we can add a carbon. We can turn it into an amine. 
we can turn it into a carboxylic acid from the nitrile group there, okay? All starting from a carbonyl. Pretty darn useful, okay? Pretty darn useful. And we'll learn another reason why it's extremely useful to be able to have that alcohol next door there. What we're going to learn later on is we'll learn about Michael additions. We're able to set up alpha, beta, unsaturated ketones, blah, 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 right, okay? And it'll actually be useful to have that alcohol there to do some of that work for us. As an example, right? We'll learn plenty of other ways. There's plenty of ways I can make this visible for you guys. Thank you. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> Dr. H, you don't have to try hard to do that. No, I'm just kidding. But, but, you know, all joking aside, right? All joking aside, have we seen anything different with how carbonyls behave in terms of mechanism? Under acidic, proning the carbonyl oxygen, bring in the nucleophile, right? Under basic, bring in the strong nucleophile to hit that carbonyl carbon first. Whether it's a nitrile or whether it's a carbonyl, it all works the same way, right? So is this a matter of memorizing 50 different mechanisms for 50 different conditions? Or is it a matter of understanding how carbonyls behave under acidic versus basic conditions? I would say it's a better for you guys to understand how to identify acidic versus basic and then figuring out the basic steps there, right? Protein carbonyl, then attack or attack first, right? And then follow through your mechanism. Good. I think there's a decent stopping point, but we're going to continue on anyway. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> ah, <there you> go. <laughs> and if we're lucky, I'll have a surprise for you guys when you guys get back on Monday. But just for you guys here, not for you, okay? So. Uh, <laughs>